Hi, Greg, and uh, I wish I was uh, in person with all of you, but uh, we make a do, and uh, maybe next year we can do it. And, Absolutely. Um, so, go ahead. No, just wanted to welcome you, and thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Uh, fantastic. So, let me tell you, uh, start with a story. Uh, the first time I visited uh, the Grand Canyon many years ago, I was struck not only by the natural beauty of the Grand Canyon, of course, but by a sign that was posted that was saying, please don't feed uh, the wild animals. And underneath it was an explanation and said that uh, you shouldn't feed them because uh, it's not good for them. It's not that uh, you are trying to save on food or uh, it's just that uh, if they get used to eat uh, uh, human food and to gather uh, human food, uh, then they uh, lose the ability to uh, live independently in the in the wilderness, and um, I feel that uh, this is uh, something that we should have posted uh, on Capitol Hill as well, with the difference. Uh, please don't feed uh, business, and uh, you want to say don't feed business not because you don't like business, but uh, quite the opposite, uh, because you love business so much that you don't want uh, to find yourself in a situation where business is so dependent on a, a rig system or a system of subsidies that uh, is uh, unable to compete and succeed in, in the global marketplace. And, um, and I think that uh, uh, the, the, the difference between a competitive system is in a competitive system, businesses make money because they're better. In a chronic system, uh, uh, businesses make money because they have distorted the rules uh, to their own advantage or because they found a way to divert government money to their own advantage. And uh, this is uh, the fundamental distinction that all too often is, is uh, misappreciated by or not appreciated by uh, the press and in the political debate, the difference between being pro-market and being pro-business. Um, if you are pro-business, you like to have uh, subsidy to business because you want to make sure that uh, uh, they make the largest amount of profits possible. If you, on the other hand, are pro-markets, you want uh, uh, to behave like uh, uh, the ranger in the uh, Grand Canyon by putting restriction, uh, ensure uh, that uh, uh, market uh, remains competitive and rules are designed properly. Um, and uh, prevent that uh, businesses became uh, too dependent uh, uh, on a uh, chronic system of rules uh, to survive. And uh, now, why as economists we are so in love with uh, uh, competitive markets is because uh, we know that in general, competitive markets do deliver uh, good social outcomes. Um, however, uh, what is very important uh, to appreciate is that uh, this good social outcome uh, does, don't uh, come uh, uh, always naturally. So th there is a tension. Uh, Greg, when he presented, repeated the word free markets, and we use that word so often that sometimes we forget uh, what uh, the term actually means. So if you go to the Webster dictionary, uh, free market, you see an economy operating by free competition. Or better, you see an economy, uh, an economic market or system in which prices are based on competition among private businesses and not controlled by a government. So both these definitions, uh, I think, emphasize uh, the element of competition, which is important, but also they don't uh, uh, say in any possible form or shape that uh, uh, markets uh, operate without rules, because in fact, Markets do uh, need rules to operate well um, and to be competitive. However, on the other hand, uh, there is a risk that these rules uh, might be distorted uh, to create bias to entry and undue burden. So, for example, uh, in, in Italy, I know that uh, to write any insurance contract, you have to uh, sign a document in person. Uh, and why is that the case? Is simply because the incumbent insurance company is trying to block uh, online insurance uh, from uh, competing. And so 
uh, imposes undue burden on consumers uh, to make sure that uh, competition is not uh, uh, full and they can earn some rents. That's uh, really the problem that uh, um, the, the problem that uh, we have when uh, rules are distorted in favor of incumbents. Now, uh, the the biggest challenge we have is uh, what guarantees that the process of rule formation delivers decent, if not optimal, rules? And the answer is basically nothing. Uh, in uh, incumbents have many ways to shape rules in their favor. And so, in general, uh, we are seeing uh, very uh, pronounced biases in favor of uh, incumbents. And so, the question that I uh, try to address in, in my book and in research that I've done even after that book is trying to think about how do we make sure that uh, we have uh, uh, the rules to make market competitive, uh, but we don't have an excessive amount of rules that uh, might uh, stifle competition and uh, increase uh, inefficiency. And uh, so, how, how do we do that? Um, uh, in a sense, uh, the, the tension in a, in a capitalist economy is that uh, we would like everything to be for sale except the rules themselves. Because if the rules were uh, for sale, uh, they would be bought out by probably the, the most uh, powerful incumbent and would not be designed to keep the market open. So we would like the rules to be uh, set by somebody like an independent arbiter. But, as we know, these independent arbiter are very hard to find. And how do we assure the independence in the process? So um, there is a page we can copy from, uh, from Bitcoin. I, I'm not a particularly fanatic of Bitcoin, and I don't think that uh, it's going to be long-term very successful. But some of the ideas behind Bitcoin are indeed very useful. And uh, one of the ideas is that the best way to make a system robust to tamper or corruption is to decentralize and distribute the power. And so the best way to make sure that rules are designed and, and market rules are designed in a way to make market more competitive and not to favor the incumbents is to actually try to bring to the table uh, the largest number of people because if you have to legislate or to uh, make rules uh, about general principles, it's much easier to find uh, uh, some points of commons that benefit everybody. Once we go into the details, once we bring uh, the interested party at the table, those interested party have a, a vested interest in distorting the rules uh, to their advantage. And so, um, but what it is in practice, uh, this uh, decentralization, distribution of power, this is nothing else than uh, some form of democracy. So I, uh, one uh, uh, point that is, is very do dear to me is precisely that if you want uh, a capitalist system to work well, you need to have a democratic system that works well, uh, uh, well at the same time. And, and you need to bring to uh, uh, the democratic process uh, uh, as many people as possible because at the end of the day they are going to um, design the rules uh, in the interest of uh, or are more likely to design the rule in the interest of the community at large rather than in the interest of uh, few small producers. Now, uh, practically, what can we do to bring uh, more people to the rulemaking process? So one idea that actually was explored by John Matsusaka is to um, get more into direct democracy. Direct democracy has a terrible reputation, at least recently, because of what happened with Brexit and uh, also uh, the mess that ensu ensued because uh, the, the, uh, the choice was not well designed. However, uh, we cannot uh, decide on an institutional system based on one observation. Um, we need to see uh, the large evidence. And, and what uh, John Matsusaka did in a recent book, he, he looked at uh, the evidence, for example, in the United States, 
uh, especially Western states like California, they have a long tradition of introducing uh, laws or popular initiatives and uh, uh, in general referenda. And, uh, and uh, what he finds is that uh, uh, there is no evidence, like uh, some people claim, that uh, uh, referenda tend to favor uh, incumbent uh, businesses. In fact, uh, the vast majority of referenda that were approved uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, the Western United States from uh, the beginning of the 20th century until 2017, the vast majority were uh, uh, referenda that introduced some uh, regulation to business uh, that uh, business did not like necessarily, but the community at large uh, like. Um, so I think that uh, uh, there is a reason uh, why uh, direct democracy has the chance of work uh, better is because uh, uh, it cut down uh, um, uh, on the intermediaries that are typical in a delegated democracy. And these intermediaries are the first one uh, that can be bought out or captured or bribed, depending on the point of view, by the incumbent businesses. And so uh, the transparency of direct democracy is really uh, very much in, in uh, uh, going in the right direction. And, and by the way, as John Masasaka argues, um, you don't need to have uh, uh, all the information to, to vote because the, one of the uh, typical objections to direct democracy is to say, um, oh, but people are not well informed. First of all, let me break it to you. Uh, our representatives are not well informed either. Uh, when um, uh, uh, the American Care Act was uh, in, introduced, Nancy Pelosi said, uh, we need to pass it to find out what is in it. So uh, member of parliaments did not read uh, the uh, Obamacare before they approve it. Um, and they did not uh, uh, vote in favor or against based on uh, their information, they voted in, in favor or against based on party lines. And so uh, I think there is a, a huge advantage in a direct democracy because uh, you don't necessarily have to vote by party lines. However, you can uh, um, not uh, go into the de detail of the law, but uh, you can uh, base on some uh, recommendation of groups that uh, you care about. So um, if you are a member of uh, the Adam Smith Society, uh, and there is an economic uh, referendum, you don't need to read the referendum. You need to know what the Adam Smith Society tells you to do. After all, basically, this is what they do in Congress. Uh, you're told by the party what to vote. The difference is in Congress, people do a lot of side deals. In a referendum, they can't. And so uh, this is uh, really a big advantage. Uh, the second aspect uh, that I discuss uh, in my book is um, the idea to keep uh, legislation uh, and regulation as simple as possible. Um, you know, there is a reason why uh, Glass-Steagall, the law that uh, separated uh, uh, commercial investment banking introduced in the 30s was so popular, but also because it was so simple. Um, in, uh, immediately uh, after the financial crisis, there was a huge pressure to reintroduce some form of Glass-Steagall. And um, uh, the, the Obama administration uh, decided, and Guyton, who was the Secretary of Treasury at the time, decided to go with a different kind of rule that was called the Volcker Rule. Now, this was a very cynical act of a uh, uh, Machiavellian act because I think Guyton knew perfectly well that the Volcker Rule was unimplementable. And uh, the reason why he went for that is because there was the majority of the public who wanted the separation and the banking industry that did it. And so uh, uh, Geithner found a compromise by finding a, a, uh, a rule that was named after an incredible uh, respect, a person that is, was super respected and with an incredible reputation like Paul Volcker. Um, however, a, a rule that uh, most of them knew that was so uh, complicated to implement and basically was unimplementable. And so that is the typical example of a, a bad rule uh, because uh, it's so complex that people can manipulate 
and the incumbent can play a huge advantage in, in, in that game. So uh, the first reason to keep uh, 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 rules simple is to make it difficult for uh, the lobbyists to sneak in loopholes in the process. And um, I am an economist and I like to play the game of finding the most efficient solution. Out of that, in my book, I, we should have simple rule even at the cost of some economic efficiency because yes, in principle, you can find the rules that are more efficient. However, the, the moment you tweak them and you make complicated, then the opportunity for lobbies to distort them become greater and greater. But the, there are also uh, two other reasons why simple rules are uh, uh, desirable. The first one is that uh, uh, if you want, uh, either through direct democracy or even through your indirect support, your representative, that the public at large be, uh, in some sense, brought to the conversation and express uh, its support for these rules, the simpler they are, the easier it is to drum up the support. After all, uh, Glass-Steagall became a very popular uh, rule um, and, and part of it was its simplicity. And last but not least is that uh, you can at least see whether simple rules are enforced or not. And so you can uh, use, uh, if you want, uh, uh, citizens' uh, oversight in uh, the extent that uh, the rules are indeed uh, what they were supposed to be and not what uh, uh, the incumbent want to, want to have. Um, so uh, I want to stop here because I want to give you plenty of time for questions, but I want to leave you with this fundamental message. Uh, for competitive markets to work well, uh, we need to have uh, some basic rules in place. Uh, the biggest challenge that the capitalist system has is to uh, find a mechanism to have these rules in place uh, in a way that uh, uh, does not distort the system. And we're still struggling with this, uh, but uh, I think that uh, going in the direction of more uh, popular involvement and simple rules might make this process uh, much easier and more successful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And now I want to invite our audience to continue to um, give some questions via the Slido tab. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. And to kick things off here, um, I have we have a question from Jim Royce. Uh, the question is, can we put can we put categorical limit, limits on di di direct democracy, or must it be all in or all out? After all, direct democracy has been used to cap property tax rates and outlaw affirmative action in California, rules best left to the legislature or judiciary. So I think that uh, in a liberal democracy, we should have some rules that protect minorities, and uh, those rules should, should be uh, not uh, uh, changeable with a referendum because uh, yes, you're right, there is the risk that a majority might uh, oppress a minority. So um, in that sense, that's uh, a, a, a limitation. Um, however, um, and, and some countries like uh, the one I, I originally come from, Italy, have some restriction, for example, you cannot put to referendum um, uh, the uh, tax laws and international treaties. Um, however, I am not, uh, uh, besides sort of uh, civil rights and stuff like that, that I think that should not be subject to referendum, I, I'm not in favor of any uh, limitations because I do think that people uh, can uh, vote in referendum uh, in a quite intelligent way. Uh, so, for example, uh, the state of Illinois had a referendum of whether to abolish uh, the, uh, the proportional tax system, we have introduced a progressive tax system for the state of Illinois. And because uh, this idea was pushed forward mostly uh, to pay for the past mistakes uh, that were made, uh, the majority of the people in Illinois voted against. 
so uh, it's not true that uh, people always vote uh, to redistribute. Uh, in Switzerland, there was a, a referendum about uh, putting a cap on the uh, difference in wage between the CEO and uh, the workers. And this, uh, this proposal was rejected with a fairly wide margin. So I think that uh, people, in my view, are much more intelligent than we give them credit to. And so I think that uh, uh, having a form of uh, uh, direct vote that could be either a popular initiative or simply um, a way to abrogate an, an existing law. Uh, so I, I don't know if you're familiar, but in the state of Ohio, there was one of the most uh, uh, corrupt deal in the history of probably the United States in which uh, there, were, there was a billion dollar in subsidy given by, to a nuclear plant by the Ohio legislature. And uh, uh, the lobbyists had to hire basically almost like a, a, a police to stop uh, the collection of signature because the referendum would have, uh, would have overturned this corrupt deal. So I think that, uh, long story short, th th there is a lot of space to go in the direction of referendums. Uh, unfortunately, the US Constitution does not allow them at the federal level, this uh, not, not yet, and we don't expect any change anytime soon. Thank you, Professor. We actually have kind of a follow-up question to that from Dylan Denalfo. Uh, who asks, hasn't the emergence of more direct democracy, new voices, led to more crony capitalism in the last few years, especially with the emergence of protectionism? Um, I think that's a, an empirical uh, question. I don't have the data, but I'm not so sure that that's the case. Um, and uh, a, I think that uh, the the answer is we need to educate better pe the, the people. If, if uh, why people vote for protectionists, it could be that they don't understand, or it could be that we're not done a, a, a good job at protecting uh, the losers out of uh, uh, the process of uh, uh, opening up the economy. As a as a uh, economist, we know that uh, in general, free trade is good. Um, however, we also know that might create a lot of uh, uh, distribution inside a country, and uh, and we are we're being fairly cavalier on some of the uh, side effect of this redistribution. So I think that some of the um, what uh, you see as direct democracy response to um, free trade might be a a cry for for help because uh, I, I think the Midwest has been pretty much devastated by uh, the free trade deals with uh, with China. And I think that might have taken place uh, too fast uh, and uh, not enough uh, uh, money dedicated to transitioning uh, the workers. And, uh, and I think we're still paying the consequences. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, we've got a question here um, about someone you may have heard of or um, Milton Friedman. Um, the question is from Manelli Dirkshani, who asks, Milton Friedman argued that the only way to stop rent-seeking is constitutional amendments for term limits and government spending limits. What would you say to that? Do you, would, do you agree, disagree, or somewhere in between? Uh, first of all, I'm not uh, a big fan of uh, term limits for a very simple reason, uh, that uh, uh, the last period you are in Congress, you really are working to find a job afterward. And so you are really uh, ready to do anything uh, for your future employers. Uh, it maximizes the problem of revolving doors that we know is already uh, very pervasive in the United States, uh, but that makes it permanent and it makes it every, whatever, two legislator, whatever the limit is. Um, and in the states where this has been implemented, did not work particularly well. Um, now, uh, I think that uh, certainly uh, limiting uh, government expenditure is a good way to uh, minimize uh, some rent seeking. However, a lot of rent seeking take place uh, 
in rules that have no necessarily budgetary implications. Uh, the example I was describing earlier, uh, the fact that you mandate a physical signature to an insurance contract is not something that uh, has any budgetary implication, uh, but it is a form of rent seeking. And so, and it is a major distortion in competition. So I think that uh, uh, I would be uh, much more aggressive on that and say, we should have uh, maybe a limitation on what kind of rules uh, we introduce uh, and uh, maybe the, the simplicity of these rules uh, or a total cap or something like this, uh, because uh, uh, otherwise uh, the risk of having uh, what we call ad hoc rules is, uh, is very important and that creates even larger rent seeking than simply capturing some government contracts. Thank you, Professor. We have a question here from Randy Zhu. Is transparency key? And if so, are there ways to systematically measure or gauge the level of crony capitalism for a sector or business? I, maybe he's almost asking, can you put like a cronyism index on a given industry or, or business? Um, so transparency is definitely key. Uh, the final level of I, I try to think a couple of times, but it's not it's not that easy. Um, and uh, you know, it's uh, in part is also uh, what you consider acceptable, not acceptable. I I, I listened to a seminar of a professor uh, from Michigan uh, who was describing uh, corruption in China. Uh, and in the United States. And she said that uh, every form of uh, revolving door, for example, is corrupt. And uh, she was giving this seminar at Stanford and uh, a bunch of Stanford faculty jump up and down, say, oh, but my colleague did this, my colleague did that, and he's not corrupt, he's not crony. So I think that uh, 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 sometimes is is a little bit in the eye of the beholder, but I think that, uh, um, at the end of the day, what you want to ask is, are the rule impartials? Uh, is, is not that different from uh, the idea of uh, an impartial law and everybody being equal under the law. Um, having an index of how unequal the law is, is complicated. Thank you, Professor. We have a question from Elior Katz. Uh, you had mentioned China earlier, Professor. She asks, how should a free market system counter non-market economies or predatory economic practices of countries like China while staying true to capitalist principles? That's a very uh, good question. Uh, not a, a particularly easy one to answer, but a very important question these days. I think that uh, the West uh, was a bit naive in uh, negotiating the entry of China and the WTO uh, because uh, they were betting that China will converge to a Western democracy and uh, and that uh, letting China in will facilitate and accelerate this process. Um, 20 years later, we realized that this was a mistake and that uh, the rules of the WTO are not sufficiently uh, good to punish for people who don't behave by the rules. And so um, I think that now unscrambling the egg is, uh, is not an easy, an easy task, and, um, uh, but is something that uh, certainly needs to be done. What I am particularly concerned about is the use um, that China does of its uh, uh, market power, even uh, uh, monopsony market power uh, to really influence uh, not only uh, the political game in the United States, but even free uh, speech. Uh, you all probably remember uh, the manager of the Houston Rockets that uh, almost got fired because he uh, retweeted a very benign tweet. So uh, we are in a world in which uh, we cannot in our own country, say what you would think for fear of uh, uh, hurting uh, 
uh, a, a superpower like China. So uh, I'm old enough to remember the Cold War. This is much worse than the Cold War because uh, in the Cold War you could say you could say whatever you want in your own country, and the Soviet Union will not come and and, and punish you in any form or shape. Right. And last evening we spoke with Secretary Condoleezza Rice, who spoke uh, about the ties between economic freedom and political freedom. Uh, you referenced that in your opening remarks here, Professor, talking about that, that you, need you, you need democracy for capitalism. Is China, is China a capitalist economy at this point, or can you comment on, on how China has introduced capitalist principles to, to unlock their potential um, without still having political freedom? So I think that uh, China is a fantastic example of uh, chronic capitalism. Uh, so it is a capitalist economy, has grown tremendously, in part because we're starting from such a low level. Uh, but uh, the part that we don't uh, very often discuss is how much uh, of uh, that wealth is accumulated by a few families that are mostly connected with the Communist Party. and. Uh, uh, I think that uh, this is, uh, of course, not very openly discussed in China, but it's not even very openly discussed in, in the West. And uh, uh, David Barbosa, who used to work for the New York Times uh, and expose some of that, will force, uh, uh, cause uh, the New York Times to lose its office in, in, uh, in Beijing. Uh, so I think that... Uh, it, we're really uh, not uh, seeing uh, uh, the, the full extent of, of the problem. And, and I think that this will eventually hunt them uh, big time. Um, but uh, uh, at the moment, we see the glamour without seeing uh, the corruption, distortion uh, underlying. Mm -hmm. We have a question here from a member. You spoke about how you didn't support term limits because you mentioned in your view that legislators, as they are leaving office, start just looking for a new job. And so that becomes their focus. So this is kind of uh, touching on that. The question is, is it possible to combat crony capitalism in an economy or market uh, when the elected and unelected people holding the reins of power are often cronyism's greatest beneficiaries. This, in the words of our question, uh, in the words of our questioner, I think is is possible if this is tempered by some direct democracy. I think that without a tempering of the, 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 the direct democracy, um, it's very hard to um, uh, to basically impact uh, the rules of the game that benefit uh, those guys. Uh, and uh, the only way, way in which you change the rules of the game is to have a referendum. In, in, in this respect, actually, uh, Italy is, is a good example. Generally, I, I, I hardly cite Italy as a good example. But uh, when things went, went really out of hand, uh, referendums even changed the way uh, a member of parliaments were elected because uh, people were upset uh, of uh, how corrupt the system was. So I think... Uh, Having the possibility of uh, uh, tempering uh, the inefficiency of the public sector with uh, some uh, law of uh, popular initiative or referendum to abrogate existing laws, I think is, is a very um, useful balance. I don't think we should do everything in that way because there is a um, information cost, but uh, retaining the option, uh, I think, is, is very valuable. Professor, you opened your comments tonight um, uh, with kind of the idea of you, you shouldn't feed wild animals, right? Because then they can't survive on their own. And so there should maybe, I don't think you said this, but maybe there should be a sign up in, in Washington that says, please don't feed the businesses. Um, but should the businesses, being different than animals and that we're humans and we're, we're, we're thinking and, and thoughtful and self-aware, um, should the private sector itself have a role in fighting cronyism? Should the private sector um, be promoting free market principles to ensure competition and innovation and the things that we want to see out of our economy? 
Um, I think it should, of course it should, uh, whether it does, uh, that's what uh, is, is more tricky. And uh, I think collectively, we all benefit from uh, having a competitive economy. Ideally, you would like every sector to be competitive except the one you operate in. I think that that's what uh, uh, every business uh, person uh, wants. And uh, so can business people form a coalition uh, on uh, the good overriding principle? Um, absolutely. Uh, does it always take place? Um, no. And in fact, uh, what I ob observe uh, throughout my life is when there was more pressure from uh, a communist threat, uh, was easier for business people to uh, coalesce on a higher ground and find uh, uh, the good uh, overarching principle. Uh, once the alternative was gone, uh, then each one went for uh, his or her own advantage. And so uh, there was less of a, a coherent uh, push in that direction and more a, a desperate search for personal favors. Thank you, Professor. We have a question from a member, Zachary Talbot. Zachary asks, any thoughts on the balance between the federal government driving an increase in digital security across private enterprise and avoiding unhealthy government control? That's, a, that's an excellent question because uh, uh, there is no doubt that uh, there is a risk we all face of disruption due to cyber attacks. Uh, we, the, the colonial pipeline attack was not... Uh, Fortunately, that disruptive, but uh, w was coming close to, and uh, and we know that uh, uh, when you see a couple of uh, near misses, eventually you're gonna have the the, the big one. So, uh, do we need to uh, protect business uh, in that dimension? Yes, and I think that uh, uh, it should be a role of the government not only to uh, regulate but also to protect in the same way in which. Uh, we need to protect against thieves. We need to protect against uh, um, criminals. And so, uh, yes, you might want to uh, uh, mandate uh, lockers if you are afraid of thieves. But uh, the most important thing is you want to have a good police. And and I think that uh, uh, you might sort of tell businesses to uh, beef up securities, uh, but... Uh, um, the, the, the most important thing is for the government to uh, actually do counterintelligence because many of these uh, uh, threats are not isolated threats. They're basically uh, almost act of wars of other countries that uh, are trying to disrupt uh, uh, the, our economy. Mm -hmm. Professor, you spoke in your remarks of an example of cronyism when there are undue burdens in the form of various regulations uh, that make it difficult for new entrants to compete against incumbents. So, but how do we discern good business, good burdens versus bad burdens? Burdens, I guess, being a regulation. Uh, is it who introduces the burden or the regulation or, or is it the principle of the burden? And, and just how do we tell the good burdens from the bad burdens, what's necessary for 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 these rules that you're talking about to ensure a competitive marketplace i think that uh, in principle it is possible to do a, a economic uh, cost benefit analysis uh, uh if you look at uh, uh, the benefit of uh, uh signing things personally yes you do have uh, a bit more of uh uh, maybe safety on uh, uh, preventing abuses uh, in, in insurance contract. But um, I think that uh, it's very hard to justify on a cost-benefit analysis that uh, you do that. Uh, the benefit is clearly uh, to create less competition for somebody. So that, that's a, a straightforward case that uh, um, uh, cannot uh, resist very long. Now, uh, think about all the rules that they put uh, for trucks uh, based on safety. Um, 
you're all too young to remember a time where in the United States there was a uh, tracking regulation and uh, there was the result of uh, uh, the existence also of uh, uh, railways regulation. But uh, uh, much of that regulation was justified on the base of uh, safety, uh, but it was an exposed justification. And, and uh, yeah, safety is important, so don't let me, uh, I don't want to uh, give the false impression, but uh, you can see what is uh, really uh, a safety concern and what is um, in uh, just a pretext. Uh, this is where independent media, independent uh, uh, academics are really important because they help uh, people uh, read through this stuff and make their own opinion. And uh, um, of course, not, not uh, everybody's independent and not everybody's right and people make mistakes. But I think that uh, if there are enough independent voices, um, I maybe I'm I'm too optimistic, but I think that the the truth will prevail in in the battle for ideas. I would certainly hope so, Professor. We're gonna we have time for one more question. Um, this question we have we have a couple of related questions here coming in from our members um, Nathaniel Sullivan and J R Scott, and they all touch around the idea of shareholder primacy and the, and the debate around shareholder primacy today. And so I'm going to try to consolidate the questions. The, the really the kind of question is firms like BlackRock uh, and others pushing for ESG uh, regulations. Um, J.R. Scott talks about the current administration's push to include social justice considerations into the regulatory review process. Do, 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 the, do these notions of ESG and, and stakeholder capitalism, as it's come to be known, introduce new levels? of cronyism within a business itself, uh, across an industry? Um, does it potentially make crony capitalism even worse? So first of all, let me do a, a bit of a advertisement because uh, um, I uh, collected a number of uh, uh, writing over uh, Milton Friedman famous uh, uh, article that uh, last year was the 50th anniversary of that article um, on uh, on Pro Market, and there is an ebook uh, that is free that you can download from Pro Market or from the Stigler Center, where we collect uh, uh, these different points of view, um, and where I provide an introduction and a conclusion where you can get a sense of uh, the complexity of of my position on this issue because it is a complex issue. Um, what I want to say is I am very worried when uh, CEOs unilaterally uh, take positions on this issue without uh, uh, much of a support, for example, from their shareholders. Um, I'm worried because, uh, number one, uh, they might pursue their political agenda or pet projects and not what uh, is best for the company and, and its shareholders. But even more important these days, because uh, many of them might be bullied or even uh, literally blackmailed into take some positions. So I think that that's a, a major concern I have. Um, on the other hand, I do believe that uh, uh, the goal of a corporation should be not just to maximize shareholders' value, but to maximize shareholders' welfare, that uh, we do care uh, about things other than money. And, uh, and so uh, shareholders can decide, for example, to uh, give up a little bit of their dividends to reduce emissions. They, if I am a 100% owner of my company, I can certainly do that. And uh, if uh, collectively the majority of the, of the shareholders want to do that, I have nothing against. In fact, I praise them for their uh, public spirit. Uh, however, this decision should be done uh, by the shareholders and uh, consistent with my position here, I am a strong advocate of direct democracy also in, uh, in the corporate arena. Well, Professor Zingales, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. I encourage everyone to uh, continue to uh, listen to the professor through his podcast, Capital Isn't. Uh, Professor, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, and uh, I hope I will meet all of you personally. Absolutely. We'll do some in-person events uh, back in the U.S. Uh, in the fall, we hope. Great.
Thanks. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Good night. Well, I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening and for a really interesting talk and conversation with Professor Zingales. Um, we took some polls 